All right, respiratory infections. So, um, respiratory infections are probably the most common type of, I don't want to say true infection because I don't want to imply that like minor wound infections aren't true, but um, let's say the most common type of noticed uh, infection and probably responsible for uh, the, the infection that's most responsible for people ending up in a hospital or emergency room or doctor's office. There's a huge variety of respiratory infections and they fall broadly into two categories based on what part of the respiratory tract they infect. Um, the upper respiratory system consists of the um, nose, mouth, pharynx, and uh, also for various reasons, the eyes, ears, and sinuses. It is coterminal with the upper digestive system. So like the mouth is considered to be a part of both the upper digestive and upper respiratory. Um, but with the exception of dental caries and gum disease, most infections of the mouth and nose are considered to be respiratory rather than digestive, though that's really just a classification issue. Um, lower respiratory infections infect the bronchi or the alveoli of the lungs themselves. Generally speaking, upper respiratory infections are common and non-fatal. They might be annoying, but they usually don't kill you. Lower respiratory infections can be very serious and can kill with relative frequency. Um, now, the, it, it's a little bit weird that we consider like the eyes and ears to be a part of the upper respiratory system, but that's because of a commonality of flora. So your upper respiratory system has a lot of different bacteria in it. Um, it might not have as much by mass, as the intestinal tract do, but by variety, it's probably where you find the most variation and numbers of different species of bacteria on your body. Um, and uh, so those are actually the most common source of at least bacterial infection of the upper respiratory system. And uh, the fact that, uh, so your ears and eyes are connected to your um, oral and nasal cavities by a number of different passageways. So um, your eyes are uh, connected uh, by your tear ducts um, your, your lacrimal ducts um, to your nose, which is why if you uh, are crying, then your nose tends to get stuffy as well. The tears just drain straight past your eyes and down into your nose. Um, similarly, your ears are connected into um, your, your nasal passage by the uh, eustachian canal. Um, so what that means is that for many of these, for, for both eyes and ears, they tend to be infected by the same set of general organisms as infect the uh, mouth and nose. So we tend to kind of classify them together, mostly. <laughs> So eyes and the mucous membranes that cover them and the eyelids, called the conjunctiva, um, 
are typically kept free of organisms of whatever sort. And the main way is by tears, lacrimal secretions, which are rich in lysozyme. It breaks down the membrane of, or the, the cell wall of bacteria, particularly gram-positive bacteria, um, which are the most common present on your skin and mouth. Uh, and also by just the fact that they're constantly being washed with, um, with lacrimal solution and that's being cleaned away by your blinking reflex means that there just aren't very many bacteria present on your eye. There shouldn't be any. Now, as far as your ears go, your external ears, which is basically everything that's outside of your uh, eardrums, are like there's plenty of bacteria there. But the, uh, the outer ear is uh, largely kept free of disease by um, uh, curumin, which is earwax, um, which is a modified... Uh, a type of modified sweat gland, actually. Um, past the eardrum, you have the middle and inner ear. Those are normally kept free of microbes. They should be sterile. Um, and when they do get infected, it, it can come from either the outside or the inside. Um, but it's fairly common that they're actually infected through the eustachian canal uh, to, uh, uh, and, and that's how microbes get access. So a middle ear infection is what's called otitis media. Um, the inner ear consists primarily of the labyrinths, and so infection of it is called lab labyrinthitis. Uh, otitis externa is an outer ear infection, fairly common. Your sinuses are also connected in with this whole set of tubes. And so again, sinus infections tend to consist of the same types of organisms as cause other upper respiratory tract infections. Your lower respiratory tract begins with your larynx and proceeds down your trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and into the alveoli of the lungs and the pleural membrane that surrounds the lungs. Your lower respiratory tract is typically kept sterile by the mucociliary escalator, right? I mean, obviously air gets down there, but any dust or microbes in that air is gonna get caught in the mucus and then your cilia that line uh, your lower respiratory tract are going to bring the mucus up and then dump it over into your esophagus and down into your stomach for the most part. Um, and your, uh, the, the alveoli of your lungs are just full of dust cells, which are a type of macrophage that eats anything that gets lodged down there. Um, inflammation of the bronchi or bronchioles is uh, bronchitis. Inflammation of the larynx, laryngitis. Um, inflammation of the lung tissue itself is called uh, pneumonitis. And uh, pneumonitis often leads, of course, through swelling, uh, to the penetration of fluid into the lungs, which is pneumonia. All right, so now that we've talked about uh, the various anatomy of it, let's talk about some of the base infections. So um, as we talked about with the digestive system, the most common types of bacteria that you're going to find in your oral cavity and nasal cavity uh, are going to be strep and staph bacteria. Uh, strep being more common in the oral cavity, um, Staph aureus being pretty common in the nares of your nose. So uh, while the vast majority of these strep are at best very opportunistic pathogens, um, there are some 
fairly virulent pathogens that may be a part of your natural flora or maybe transient, but a, a certain number of the population always has them, and a lot of people have them at least a couple of times a year. Uh, that said, we're going to turn to our old friend, uh, Strep pyogenes. So we mentioned Strep pyogenes as a common uh, infectious agent um, when we talk about wound infections. And in fact, the thing that it is most famous for is the causative agent of strep throat. Well, the technical term for strep throat is streptococcal pharyngitis. Pharyngitis just means inflammation of the pharynx, which is your throat. Uh, common signs and symptoms, sore throat, difficulty swallowing, and of course, strep pyogenes is pyogenic. And uh, so strep throat is often accompanied by fever. Um, the th throat in, in uh, strep throat is um, red, raw, and typically has white patches of pus. And these um, white patches are a diagnostic symptom, right? If you look back there, and it just looks irritated, it's probably not strep throat. If you see these big patches of pus and inflamed tonsils, um, then it's much more likely to be strep throat. Strep throat is uncomfortable uh, by itself. It's not typically dangerous, but strep bacteria can move from the throat to a variety of other places causing more serious infections. So the pathogenesis, uh, strep pyogenes has a lot of possible virulence factors. They're usually not all present. Um, the most common ones are going to allow for evasion of the immune system and uh, toxins that kill host cells. The epidemiology, um, strep bacteria are common in the environment and some people are always going to have them. It's fairly common for there to be asymptomatic carriers of strep pyogenes and um, often, uh, you know, it's non-infectious unless something causes a weakness to the area already. So it's not uncommon for some other viral respiratory ailment, like say a cold or a sinus infection or something like that to precede strep throat. They, they basically weaken the immune system and inflame the tissue and that gives strep pyogenes that might already be present possibility to, um, uh, to invade. That having been said, um, once strep is growing in an infectious mode, it becomes more pathogenic. And so if you have strep throat, it is possible to pass it on, usually through either droplet transmission or um, as sometimes contaminated food, but also fomites are probably the most common. Uh, and even after recovering, you can be a carrier for weeks to months. Uh, treatment and prevention. So diagnosis is by a rat, well, usually by either throat cultures or what's called a rapid strep test, which is probably the most common nowadays. They've become so cheap and ubiquitous. Um, the treatment is Typically antibiotic, strep pyogenes is very easily treatable with antibiotics. Penicillin or erythromycin is about 90% effective. And even though you're unlikely to die of strep throat specifically, um, there are a number of things that can come as a result of strep throat 
that you want to avoid, and so treatment is actually very important. Um, prevention is... There's no good assured way of prevention. Um, you probably have a native streptococcal flora at least some of the time throughout the year. So other than like standard, you know, don't get contaminated by somebody who has an active case of strep throat, there's not a whole ton of prevention. Now, when I said that there's a whole lot of things that can follow on from strep throat, uh, those are called post-streptococcal sequelae. Uh, sequelae is a, a common thing where a disease can have consequences that might not appear for months or years into the future. With strep throat, there are a bunch of other things that strep pyogenes can cause. And if you don't get it treated, even though your immune system may control it in your throat, you'll have a larger native population of strep pyogenes that can go on to cause these problems later. Um, so common ones, rheumatic fever. Uh, rheumatic fever is, um, well, it's a fever, usually associated with joint pains, hence rheumatic, chest pains, rash, nodules under the skin, um, it can result in cardiac damage, which is not awesome. Um, card and uh, carditis, inflammation of your heart, uh, can lead to chronic rheumatic heart disease, which is difficult to treat. Um, now most people who have strep throat don't go on to develop sequelae, but a reasonable percentage do, about 3% of untreated cases, which is enough that you don't want to mess around with it. The pink eye, earache, and sinus infections. Um, these are often going to be caused by the same thing. Um, they will often occur in conjunction with each other. Uh, because they're caused by the same organism and all of these things are linked together by tubes. Uh, conjunctivitis is inflammation of the eye, um, or rather of the membrane surrounding the eye. Um, it can be either viral or bacterial in its cause. Uh, viral cases are usually less severe, but also less treatable. Uh, Bacterial cases can be more serious, but are typically easily treated with antibiotics. So with good treatment, you can clear them up really fast. Um, most people have some experience with pink eye. Even if you haven't had it yourself, you've picked up some stuff. So you get you know, swollen eyes, lots of gunk forming there. Um, Tears, redness, sensitivity to light, uh, sometimes fever. Uh, with otitis media, that's a middle ear infection. Uh, speaking from experience here, uh, the pain of otitis media is fairly unique. I don't necessarily mean that it's worse than other types of pain, but it's qualitatively different from it often like a combination stabbing pain um, combined with nausea and dizziness because it mucks with your uh, equilibria sensation apparatus uh, can result in vomiting either just from the pain or from the like dizziness and inability to walk and disorientation that comes with it. Uh, I had this back when I was in college and I remember um, like it got to the point where I could not walk 
at all. If I tried to walk, I would just sort of tip over to the left. And um, the pain with otitis media will sometimes like increase and increase and increase and build and build and build until the eardrum ruptures and there's a sudden release of pressure, often accompanied by a squirt of pus and blood, um, that then relieves the pain momentarily. But that means that you do have to worry about secondary infection. Sinusitis, thankfully I don't have uh, frequent sinus infections, but people who do um, tell me that the, the pain there is very sort of similar in that it is just not really describable as, as a type of pain that you would associate with something external. Um, facial pain, pressure, headache, malaise, sometimes thick green nasal discharge, the symptoms of sinusitis. Usually if you have a sinus infection, you know you have a sinus infection. Common infectious organisms. Uh, most common are going to be Haemophilus influenzae, which is gram-negative rod, and Strep pneumoniae. Uh, other than Strep pyogenes, Strep pneumoniae is the second most common infectious strep out there. And all of these things can also be caused virally as well. Um, so sinus infections and middle ear infections are not necessarily contagious. It's hard to pass on an ear infection to somebody else. The sinus infections also often have whatever the infectious organism is present in the nose and will accompany an upper respiratory, like coughing, sneezing type infection. It can be passed on that way. Conjunctivitis or pink eye is extremely, uh, uh, extremely pathogenic or uh, virulent uh, and spreads easily through fomites. Uh, all three of these disorders are usually preceded by an upper respiratory infection. Sore throat, sneezing, coughing, you know, malaise, that sort of thing. You get a, a rhinitis, a nasal issue, and it spreads from there to eyes, ears, sinuses, or some combination of them. Um, so if we're talking bacterial disorders, then asymptomatic carriers are extremely common, and some people harbor native populations. Um, chances are good that if you have a case of bacterial Sinus infection, um, it's particularly true of sinus infections, but sinus infection or otitis media, uh, then the chances are highly increased that you'll have a second one, right? The bacteria often hide out and just become a part of your normal flora, but they can cause problems repeatedly throughout the course of your life. It's very hard to get rid of all of the bacteria. Uh, let's see, treatment and prevention. Depending upon the causative organism, antibiotics are typically very useful. Um, strep pneumoniae, there are resistant strains, um, but most strep pneumoniae is treatable with beta-lactams. Uh, Haemophilus influenzae is also uh, fairly treatable. There aren't too many resistant strains out there. Um, that's of course if it's bacterial. If it's viral, usually it's less severe, but no cure. You just gotta wait it out. Um, so yeah, decongestants and antihistamines can be uh, particularly in the case of bacterial uh, upper respiratory can decrease the immune response and can result in a temporary alleviation of symptoms but a uh, greater length of time and more likelihood of developing calculations. 
Um, for conjunctivitis, because it's extremely contagious, particularly by fomites, you want to use good hand washing procedure, don't rub your eyes, everything like that uh, to prevent treatment or to prevent uh, spread. Um, as I said, some people who have sinu chronic sinus or ear infections, um, if you get them once, the chances are pretty good that you'll get them again and again and again. And if that's the case, you can have um, tubes inserted through the eardrums uh, that basically act to alleviate pressure in those cases. Viral infections of the upper respiratory system. Um, there are lots of them. And they all tend uh, to get lumped together as being called the common cold. I want to emphasize that the common cold is not a disease. It is a generic term that we use for a whole set of diseases. Um, there are hundreds of different viruses involved, um, and they all have kind of similar symptoms. Some are going to be worse in some respects, some are going to be worse in other respects, but um, they all have sort of a similar set of symptoms. Malaise, sore throat, runny nose, cough, sneezing, hoarseness, um, usually no fever. Um, they're viral. Uh, they can result in inflammation, uh, but usually not pyogenic, you know, pus. Um, Typically, coughs are non-productive, meaning they're like dry rather than wet, and they last anywhere from a couple of days to a week-ish, and you might have like lingering symptoms for a while after that as your body clears itself of the leftover viruses. Um, so... The causative agents, again, there's hundreds of them. Uh, they all have kind of similar symptoms, so we call them all cold. But there are uh, the most common type, right? So 30 to 50% of cold-causing viruses are what are called uh, rhinoviruses, which just means viruses that infect the nose. Um and they're kind of like all related, but uh, then there's the other half, you know, 50 to 70% that aren't rhinoviruses and could be totally other things. Um, most people will get a cold or two throughout the course of the year. Um, They usually infect respiratory epithelial cells. Um, they're usually pretty virulent, fairly contagious. Uh, they spread primarily through droplet and fomite transmission. Uh, they lead to inflammation, which in the respiratory tract means increased mucus production, um, inflamed red painful areas in the nose and throat. Uh, nasal secretions, usually watery, drainy, eventually becoming thicker and more greeny. Uh, watery eyes, sometimes earache, um, often sort of general cloudy, fuzzy head feeling. Uh, and some of them can go on to do other things, like, say, infect your ears eyes, or sinuses. Um, they're like, so they always uh, talk about a uh, cure for the common cold. I want you to sort of understand that that's a myth because the common cold isn't one thing. It's hundreds of things. We've got, like, there are probably plenty of cures for the common cold, but the problem is going to be discovering which of the several hundred different infectious agents you have, and then is there a thing to cure that specific one? And like, generally speaking, a cold isn't all that serious, so 
the time and effort that you would put forth to figure it out, like by the time you actually know what you've got, it's gone. So there's not really any point. And there's no vaccine for it because any vaccine for it would have to vaccinate you for hundreds and hundreds of different things. Actually, that's not quite true. Um, I have heard of some work on a vaccine that like targets the six to 10 most common of those hundred. So it isn't like gonna actually present, prevent you from getting a cold, but it might decrease the likelihood by rendering you immune to the most common causes of the common cold. Uh, I don't know exactly what um, progress has been made with that recently, but I've heard of it. Uh, for the most part, humans are the main reservoir for cold-causing viruses. Um, colds are usually most infectious early on, from their prodromal pre-symptomatic period to a couple of days in. Um, once you start to get better, you're usually significantly less infectious. Uh, we call it a cold doesn't have anything to do with being cold. Being cold doesn't increase the likelihood of you getting cold. Um, being outside without shoes or socks on is uncomfortable. Doesn't mean that there's any more likelihood of getting cold. It just happens to be that in the Northern Hemisphere, the time when um, these viruses are mostly out there is winter when it's cold out. Uh, treatment and prevention. I mean, prevention is going to be just good, like, hand-washing techniques and don't get infected by somebody who has the cold. Um, treatment is primarily going to be uh, increasing the comfort of the person who has it, right? So you want rest, fluids, protein, um you know, chicken soup. Chicken soup, there's nothing special about it, but like it's got lots of fluids and, you know, energy and good source of protein. Um, just, yeah, rest and, uh, and, and take care of yourself and that's the best treatment for a common cold. Pneumococcal pneumonia. Right, so strep pneumoniae is the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia. Um, and we call pneumonia caused by strep pneumoniae pneumococcal pneumonia. Uh, and I should say that it's the most common cause in adults. Um, so signs and symptoms of pneumonia... Uh, pneumonia often follows a upper respiratory tract infection or a viral lower respiratory tract infection. Um, usually the, unless you're immunocompromised, the streptococcus pneumoniae can't really get established very easily, but, uh, an other disease can alter that by uh, doing damage to the lining of your um, trachea and bronchi, uh, compromising your mucociliary escalator. So the signs and symptoms are going to be cough, um, often a productive cough, like a cough that's wet, where you actually have to spit something out afterwards. Fever, sometimes high fever chest pain, difficulty breathing, sputum production, um, coughing up a kind of like thick, pussy, greenish liquid. Um, like I said, it usually follows on after a other respiratory infection. Uh, coughing up blood, so a pinkish color is not uncommon. Uh, the diagnostic symptom of pneumonia is what are called rails, um, which are sort of these 
snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies like sounds uh, produced in somebody's chest when they are inhaling and exhaling. Um, and if you use a stethoscope, you can hear them very, very, very easily. It, it sounds like bubbles going through water because that's what it is. Uh, with pneumonia, you often have shallow, rapid breathing because of a loss of lung function. Um, and pneumonia can be very serious. So bad cases of pneumonia often require hospitalization and that is among the most common causes of mortality in the elderly and immunocompromised populations. Pneumococcal pneumonia is caused by strep pneumoniae, um, which is a gram-positive diplococcus uh, and uh, has a thick polycaps uh, polysaccharide capsule. Um, there are a number of different strains for it, um, some of which we have a good vaccine for and some of which we don't, and some of which are just a lot more infectious and virulent than others. And strains that don't have the capsule don't cause any disease, but they might be part of your normal flora. Um, so once uh, the here, uh, once the the pneumococcus gets into your lungs, it begins replicating inside of the alveoli. Um, causing pain in the lining of the lungs, or pleurisy, um, damaging the epithelium, uh, preventing the proper expulsion of pus and mucus from the lungs. Uh, so you have to cough a lot in order to get that stuff out, which also weakens the lungs. Uh, from the lungs, it can enter into the bloodstream, potentially causing endocarditis or infection of the inner lining of the heart, meningitis, septicemia. Um, those are the big ones. Uh, it is not uncommon for people to have uh, potentially pathogenic strains of strep pneumoniae just present in their body all the time. It's a common native flora and a very common transient flora. Uh, but for the most part, like, it's not typically, well, it can be an upper respiratory infectious agent and, and does result in, in um, some of those bacterial upper respiratory disorders. Uh, but it usually can't get easily down into the lungs because your lungs do a really good job of keeping themselves clean. So it usually has to wait for something else that's going to cause weakness in your lungs in order to get down. So um, anything that's going to impair your immune system, alcohol and narcotic use, viral respiratory infections, Lung disease, diabetes, cancer, or old age are all things that can lead to it. Uh, prevention. Uh, there, like I said, there is a vaccine, uh, the, the Pneumovax, which uh, vaccinates against 23 pneumococcal strains, and they are the usually most virulent and most likely to cause pneumonia. It's generally recommended that anyone over the age of 55, I believe, get the pneumovax. Um, and also anyone who is uh, diabetic or otherwise potentially immunocompromised should get it. Um, it's usually not given to children or the, the standard pneumovax is usually not given to children or healthy adults. There is a um, other vaccine against 13 strains, which is often given to infants and children. Uh, treatment is typically via antibiotics. 
So penicillin, erythromycin are like something like 90% of strains are going to be vulnerable to one of those. Um, and they are, uh, um, it's particularly effective the earlier in treatment that you give it, um, preferably before they can start to grow as a biofilm. Uh, and unfortunately, resistant strains are becoming more common. And so that means that if you have a native population of uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae and you don't take antibiotics properly, like say for something else, um, you don't finish off your cores, you don't, uh, you know, take them according to the instructions, you can actually increase the likelihood of your having a uh, resistant strain as a part of your native flora, which is bad. Pneumococcal pneumonia is not the, um, the only type of pneumonia, and I'm not going to go through everything for all of these, um, but Klebsiella pneumoniae is um, a gram-negative rod on Enterobacteriaceae. Uh, you guys have worked with it in lab in all likelihood. Uh, it is also a cause of um, pneumonia, Let's see, uh, mycoplasma, uh, uh, mycoplasmal pneumonia is sometimes called walking pneumonia, and it's the most common childhood cause of pneumonia. Usually produces a milder variant of the disease, which is, um, like, doesn't necessarily require hospitalization, but also doesn't respond super well to some antibiotics. Uh, mycoplasma does not have a native cell wall. So anything that targets the cell wall isn't going to work on it. Uh, Legionnaire's disease is a, another pneumonia causing agent. Um, rather recently discovered in 1976, um, caused by Legionella pneumophilia, and uh, it has the honor of being one of the few environmentally reservoir pneumonias. Um, so I'm not going to go through everything here, but it has common pneumonia symptoms. Uh, Legionella pneumophila is a gram-negative rod. Uh, and the common sources of, uh, of infection are infected water. Um, so it's not usually spread from person to person. It's not usually a part of your body's natural flora, but what it does grow is in still water supplies. And in order for it to cause pneumonia, you have to inhale it, which means... How do you inhale water, right? Well, it might be because you're like, you know, swimming or something and you choke some of it in. Most commonly, it's put into some sort of aerosol. There have been lots of cases of uh, Legionnaire's disease spread from uh, those like mister things that often in Las Vegas we have, you know, at, at any place where you sit outside in the summertime uh, to cool you down. So if some uh, uh, if some bacteria gets inside of there, then it gets aerosolized and you breathe in the mist. Um, also in aerosols from central air conditioning systems, nebulizers, um, sprays for uh, watering plants or for keeping vegetables moist in uh, a like grocery store. Um, and there have been recent, uh, there was a spate of recent cases I heard that were associated with a hot tub at a state fair. When you think about like a, a jacuzzi type thing, right? You know, it's got like all the bubbles going on and, you know, people splashing and stuff like that and a whole bunch of people getting in and out all the time. So lots of chance for bacteria to get in there. 
and the bubbles basically aerosolize it and people breathe it in. Uh, so prevention is good water quality. And when there is an epidemic, tracing it down and shutting it off, right? Because it's not contagious from person to person if you go, oh, everyone who has this case of Legionnaire's disease went to this restaurant that has an ounce dyed mister system. You just go there and you turn off their mister and you tell them that they have to totally do a deep clean on their um, water reservoir. Boom, you stop the spread. Uh, as far as treatment goes, it's a gram negative rod. So those can be tricky to treat. Um, high doses of erythromycin or rifampin, it's usually penicillin resistant. Um, treatment can take a long time. Uh, RSV, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, this is the uh, viral agent that causes croup. Uh, the diagnostic symptom is the specific, what's called barking cough. It, it causes an irritation of the throat and vocal cords that leads to this. I can't do it now because I don't have it, but it, it, it sounds like a, 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 a dog or a seal barking. Um, it's a common childhood disease. Um, often results in hospitalization of young children. In the industrialized world, if you get treatment, it's unlikely to uh, cause death, but it can, if you delay treatment or if you don't have a local hospital you can go to, uh, it can be fatal under certain conditions. Um, yeah, you're like super contagious. So you want to prevent contact with it. Uh, there's currently a vaccine under development. I haven't heard that it's been approved yet. Fungal infections of the lung. Uh, histoplasmosis, I want to talk about this, right? So this is sometimes called spelunker's disease. Uh, it is a um, fungal spore disease, which is endemic to certain parts of the U.S. Um, it has symptoms similar to tuberculosis. Uh, it is like it's super common for people to get, but most people who get it are asymptomatic or just very mildly symptomatic. They might get it and feel like they have just gotten like a weird off season cold or something like that and it goes away in a couple days. Um, the, uh, the people who it is most likely to be a problem in are the immunodeficient. So it's a, a major killer of um, people with HIV AIDS, uh, in the advanced stages, in areas where it is endemic. Um, signs and symptoms, if they occur, are fever, cough, chest congestion, shortness of breath, um, sometimes mouth sores. The causative agent is the fungi Histoplasma capsulatum, which is a soil fungi, uh, particularly in soils that are contaminated with bird or bat droppings, hence Spelunker's disease. It's particularly common in people who, um, the most common is in people who keep, keep pigeons and people who go into caves. And for that reason, it is recommended that if you are HIV positive that you not keep pigeons or go into caves. Um, it gets into your lungs and gets inside of the macrophages inside of your lungs and grows inside of them, producing what's called 
uh, macroconidia, where you have like spores happening inside of the macrophages. Um, it can resemble TB, particularly on a lung X-ray. So if you've had histoplasmosis, or honestly, if you're an outdoorsy type living anywhere in the Ohio, Pennsylvania Valley, um, then chances are pretty likely that, you know, a doctor might look at your, your chest x-ray and go, ah, looks like you have tuberculosis or have had it. Now, it isn't necessarily the case. Commonly mimics it. So the epidemiology, it's endemic to areas where the fungus grows in the soil, which is primarily going to be the Ohio River Valley, um, as well as up and down the uh, Mississippi. Um, these are relatively wet places um, with a high soil moisture contents. You can see all over here the type of area where it typically is. Um, as far as treatment and prevention, prevention is just avoiding soil contaminated with bird or bat droppings. Uh, treatment, it's a fungal disorder, so they're difficult to treat. Usually, uh, because antifungal agents can be, like, worse than the disease, unless somebody has a particularly nasty case or is immunocompromised, we typically just let it run its course. Um, the medications that are effective against it have serious side effects. We're unlikely to use them unless there's a reason why we think this particular patient is susceptible. All right, so that is... Um, the respiratory infections, I do want to say that you should pay particularly close attention to tuberculosis and valley fever. Uh, I think valley fever is in your book. I know that tuberculosis is. And those I would consider to be, you know, important.